All right, so we'll kick off the day with a completely uncontroversial uh, conference at 10, 20, 10, 17 uh, at Starknet CC. Why do we need blockchains? So it's been 15 years since the Bitcoin white paper, if you're really good with math. 15 years since the uh, Bitcoin white paper, a whole bunch of things happened, but oddly enough, after one dude posted a PDF on an emailing list uh, for crypto heads, uh, 15 years after that, it, we're all in the same room speaking today, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. I wouldn't go so far as to call it the single greatest thing to happen on this planet since the origin of life, as Nick Land is doing in his book, Cryptocurrent, but I think we can all agree that it was a bit of a watershed moment for computer science overall. So what do blockchains give us? Blockchain give us mainly two things. They give us trustlessness, you're pretty sure that when something is executed on the blockchain and when something works on the blockchain, that it's true, irrevocably. And this characteristic stems from the other main component of blockchain, which is decentralization. So obviously, on that part with different blockchains, conditions may apply, but anyone can join the network, anyone can contribute computing power, and that's the very thing that is the linchpin of the trustlessness. And both of them coexist to create this great thing that we call blockchains. And what do we do with these? Um, this is taken from the Ethereum white paper, and if you look at them, well, we mostly take all the boxes with various um, amounts of usage, obviously, but most of the applications that we thought about blockchain, at least in the Bitcoin uh, Ethereum white paper, have been put into practice. Um, lucky for me, if we want to think about what do we really need blockchains for? Someone has already thought about this for me, uh, and it's blockchain blogger Jesus Polinia, who breaks down three main characteristics of blockchain and says, okay, these are like a three core tenets of blockchain. You want to use blockchain if you need something that is peer-to-peer. -peer. Do note that this is not a fundamental part of it. If you only need peer-to-peer, -peer, you can just use BitTorrent or peer-to-peer -peer network. But the very meaty part is the strict global consensus. It's the fact that whatever is executed on the blockchain, whatever is there, is true once and for all. It's like a truth machine, which is pretty funny when you think about it. But the caveat to that is the third point, which is objectivity. The, no matter what we want to say, smart contracts are really, really dumb in the sense that they can only understand whatever is diegetic to the blockchain. You can only understand whatever is here on the blockchain from the get-go. Contracts are really cool because they're flexible in the real world. You can always incorporate more stuff, but blockchains, because they have strict global consensus, require strict objectivity. You can only parse whatever is happening inside the system. I would go so far as to say that blockchain is interesting for internet native value, based on the three characteristics that Polinia explained there. And that means cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and games. Before blockchain, it wasn't possible to have internet native value. All the value that was ascribed to the internet came from the outside, from banking systems, from your credit card, from your checks. But it wasn't an integral part of the internet, which was really funny. If you look back on like the 90s, the very early um, cypherpunks, they were like, oh yeah, we're putting, they called, they called it crypto commerce. They, th they said, oh yeah, now that we have RSA uh, in asymmetric encryption, it's gonna be really cool. We're gonna be able to do a whole bunch of things on the, on the internet. And there was a little footnote saying, oh yeah, money will just solve that later, but it took another 30 years before we got there. I'd go so far as to say that blockchain is probably only interesting for internet native value. The reason is, if you're doing anything but internet native value, you're probably better off using another system. If you don't strictly need a coherent system, if you don't strictly need P2P operation, if you don't strictly need, as Polinia said, strict global consensus, you just maybe you may be better off with a centralized database. Um, I know it's a bit controversial, but it is the case. It's been 15 years since we're on the blockchain, and the things that have really taken off are cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and games. DeFi is a corollary of internet native money. And when you start really thinking about this, it's like, okay, blockchain gives us trustlessness and decentralization, but what if I only want trustlessness? What if I'm not really interested in censorship resistance? What if I'm not really interested in 
anything, all the great things that blockchain gives us, such as censorship resistance, uh, anyone can join the network. Maybe I'm happy with something a bit more centralized, but I'd like it to be verifiable and trustless. And the funny thing is, because we've had the blockchain for 15 years, it's like a hammer and everything looks like a nail. And so every time someone comes up with a, the, uh, a trustlessness problem, they're like, oh yeah, super easy. Just put it on the blockchain. Supply chain, put it on the blockchain. Real estate, put it on the blockchain. Banking system, just rewrite everything that we've been doing for 200 years and put it on the blockchain. And it seems a bit like um, maybe a little ham-fisted attempt at solving problems that are only pertaining to trustlessness. But what do we do if we want to prove something without putting it on the blockchain? Lucky for us, we've got zero-knowledge proofs. And these things are pretty cool, because the main thing that... Uh, in, I'm talking about zero-knowledge proofs in like a very broad sense, both validity proofs and actual zero-knowledge proofs. I know Eli Ben Sasson is probably crying somewhere in Israel right now. So if we look back at blockchain, they give us trustlessness and decentralization. But if you look at proofs, they give us trustlessness. That's the only thing they give you. I can prove to you that I know the 10th number of the Fibonacci sequence, but that's it. I can prove to you that I've made a banking transfer, but it doesn't mean that there's any censorship resistance going on here. Louis said it really well. What ZK will bring to the table is the ability to not think about decentralization as a source of trustlessness. And that's pretty neat. We've been looking at zero knowledge proofs for a long time in blockchain. This is actually taken, this is Satoshi um, talking on the Bitcoin forum saying, if a solution was found to have better zero knowledge proofs because it was still very theoretical um, back in the day, a much better, easier, and more convenient implementation of Bitcoin would be possible. And he goes on to say, yes, but that doesn't solve the double spend problem because that's what he was very adamant about. He said, oh yeah, we need censorship resistance, we need a way to have internet-native money. But zero-knowledge proofs are not really... That's the, the only thing that they can do. But if you really want internet-native money, obviously you can use zero-knowledge proofs to like scale your system, but that can't be the core tenet of whatever you're building. So what if we use proofs without blockchains? And yes, I am actually talking about not putting anything on chain, just using the tools that we've built to scale the blockchains and applying them to other types of use cases. So I asked around uh, if anyone had actually come up with some real use cases for using Cairo, provers, proofs, specifically outside of blockchain or AI. And lucky for me, um, Eli from Stockware was uh, nice enough to answer me and managed to obliterate me in two letters on Twitter publicly. Uh, but I'm a stubborn guy, so I dig a bit more. What can we use zero knowledge proofs for the trustlessness only use case? And there's a whole class of problems that you can solve. Um, the first one is actually Ellie who sent it to me, is you can prove that someone is or is not in a database. You can prove to you that, prove that someone has maybe, is part of like a, um, has like committed a crime without revealing the entire database. So you have a lot of use cases. The last one, fighting AI generated audio with attested macro friends and ZK snarks is really funny. So you had um, Andrew Yang, Anna Rose, and Kobe Gurken who said, now that we have generative AI, now that we have, um, it's, it's very easy to doctor an interview. How are you sure that whatever changes were made to, um, to an audio actually came from the original file? And so what they've done is you speak in a microphone that magically has some attestation, div, um, attestation process, which signs the input that came out of it. Then you process it with the edited audio, but you putting everything within a ZK proof, meaning that you're able to prove that whatever change happened to the source material actually happened to the source material. So this is a bit of a more complicated diagram of what they're doing, but every single one of them, Anna, Daniel, and Kobe, records on the microphone, signs with their keys. In the middle, you have remove background noise and combine to create like the single interview. And all of these addition to the source material are tested and verify by the zero knowledge proof. Pretty cool, right? If we look at most of the use cases that I found for applications of zero knowledge proofs outside of blockchain, it's usually when you have a computing power imbalance. 
you yourself with a single, my Lenovo laptop, I can't really compete with AWS. I can't rerun their entire computation, uh, the entire computation that they're doing. In an adversarial environment, when I can't really trust them, it's pretty cool if I can verify whatever they're doing on their own end on their cloud computing. And anonymity. It's pretty cool if I don't have to reveal everything else, but I can still prove that something has happened. So if you look at in more detail some of the other use cases that people are doing, um, I have really to comment the Giza team, for instance, for pushing the envelope on the ZKML. You have a machine learning algorithm, you're not really sure how it works, and it takes a long time to train them, and you don't really know which set of data it was, it was trained on. But what you can do is just produce a proof. Here's the proof that the weights and the model that we trained is actually coming from that one set of data. And that's great, because you have all three here. Computing power and balance in an adversarial environment where you need to guarantee anonymity of the original data set. Pretty cool. So that's a very funny example that I saw on Twitter once. You could use zero knowledge proofs for verifiable tax computation. So we all trust the government to compute the taxes properly, obviously. But it would be pretty cool if they could produce a proof that, OK, here's all the data that I took in. Here's how much you owe me. And here's a proof that you don't need, and you don't need to go on Excel and do all the weird um, calculation yourself. Obviously, in this example, if the poor taxpayer sees a problem and the proof doesn't compute, they can't force the government to give back the money because we're not executing anything on the blockchain. There's no censorship resistance. There's, there's no compel, it doesn't compel the government in doing anything. But that's why we have laws. And it's still a leg up. It's still a clear improvement from the current situation where it's like, OK, I'm going to need to recompute everything. And uh, you can even have an automatic claiming system. It's still centralized, but still an improvement. So that's basically the state of ZK as I've found after um, AD made fun of me on Twitter. We've applied ZK to blockchain and AI first and foremost, but everything else is kind of forgotten. And it's a bit funny when you think about it. And to really understand why this is happening, I think we need to take a look at the history. Does anyone know what this thing is? This is called a yellow pile. This is a very, very primitive steam engine. So the first drawings that we get in the descriptions come from 30 to 20 BC from Vitruvius and Huron. And the way it works is you've got this fire underneath that heats up the water, the steam exhaust from the two pipes, which creates a circular motion. This is a very, very primitive steam engine. I'm pretty sure the Romans must have used it extensively and not only uh, relied on extens extensively on uh, uh, slaves and human resources to uh, um, kickstart their own industrial revolution, right? They didn't really, even though they had the steam engine. So why didn't they do it, even though they had the technology? Again, lucky me, someone has answered this question for me again. Brett Devereux, which is a history professor in the US, the problem was that the first steam engines were just not that efficient that it would trigger anything else. And the funny thing is, the very conditions for the emergence of the Industrial Revolution were all of them in the UK at the end of the 18th century. Because you start with the, the very crude steam engine that we had, 1712, the new common steam engine, which works on coal. Very crude, uh, very jerky, doesn't work that well. But the first thing that we applied it to was pumping out water out of the coal mines. And the reason it was it made sense to use that very primitive steam engine, which was very badly inefficient. Badly efficient is because it used coal. It, so it was right next to a source of coal. So it was actually cheaper to use it. And the more you used it to pump water out of the coal mines, the more coal was there, which means that more people could use the steam engines. And you have a virtual circle. The engine becomes more effective. So that's the first really cool stuff that happened and increased the efficiency of the steam engine. The second thing that happened is, now that we have this improved steam engine, what is very, very, a very popular industry in the UK at the end of the 18th century? It's the textile industry. And the funny thing is, the major bottleneck of that industry back then was spinning fibers onto a thread, which requires a constant circular motion, which a steam engine is perfect at doing. And there you go again the steam engine applied to the textile industry becomes even more effective. And this is because you had first 
steam engine applied to coal uh, mining, then to the textile industry, that you were able to create smaller, more efficient engines that could then be applied to create ships, cars. The very first trains were actually built in the coal mines because you had access to coal. It was very easy to use. But let's go back to blockchain now. We've got zero knowledge proofs. What do we apply them to? Blockchain. Woo! And thanks to that, the ZKPs become more effective. We have Cairo, which is a language to write your proofs with. The provers become more effective. All great. So obviously, we have another use case that is going to take these zero knowledge proofs and make them even more effective. And the problem is, I don't know. That's where we're at right now. There are obviously a lot of potential tech unlocks. Uh, Wasm, more efficient provers, FPGAs, yada, yada, yada. I would contend that this is not the main problem. The main problem is we just don't really know what to apply it to. And once it gets there, it will very, very naturally, all these improvements will come flowing in. Uh, I really like this tweet, um, and I quite agree with it. I do think that the next thing that we're going to apply ZK to is not going to come from blockchain, but it was because blockchain was there that we were able to develop all these cool stuff. So yeah, my uh, final word would be use Cairo, use all the provers, with or without the blockchain, and remember that sometimes it's okay to just prove it. Thank you, folks.